Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You know, some passages of Scripture make us squirm, don't they? You read through them and you get to the end, and in church you're supposed to say, thanks be to God or praise to you, O Christ, but you get there and you're not feeling all that thankful for what you just heard. You're not feeling particularly like you want to praise the person who just said it to you because it was a difficult word to hear, a difficult pill to swallow. And it leads us to think, surely Jesus didn't really mean that. There's got to be some other explanation, another secret meaning that I'm missing, right? You might be tempted to think, well, there must have been some ornery translator or editor since Jesus was alive to now that added that in without His consent, and it isn't really what Jesus would say. Or we come up with all different variations of reasons why, ultimately, if we don't like it, maybe we don't have to listen to it. Well, today our gospel reading is one of those passages It's one of those passages where there's a harsh edge to it, we'd rather it not be there, because it makes makes our nice, neat conception of the way God is and the way we want Him to behave and act hard to hold on to. It reminds us that He is who He is, not just who we hope or think He should be. And this isn't the only place in Scripture where that occurs, and I'm sure as soon as I mentioned such passages, maybe one or two of them popped into your own head that you've wrestled with over the years. But in our text for today, if we dig deeper, if we leave behind our selfish hopes about what we wish God would do or would be, we'll find that Jesus does mean what He says. And our Old Testament reading for today from Jeremiah starts, I think, with a warning that we should heed even today as we engage with God's Word. Here's what he says. I'll read it again. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the Word of God, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. It seems like it's not a small or light task to hear the Word of God, and that we must be on guard, not only against those outside of us who would lead us astray, but even against our own heart, which seeks to get us to follow vain hope and the desires that we wish would be true. So with that warning in mind, let us quiet our spirits and see what the Word of God has to illuminate to us today. So the first thing that jumps out at you in this passage, of course, is that Jesus says, do you think I came to bring peace? No, but division. And the reason that sticks out to us is very understandable. There are so many other examples in the Scripture where it says that Jesus is coming to bring peace. Not just here in Luke, but many in Luke, such as in Luke chapter 1, verse 79, the prophecy of Zechariah about Jesus says that He's going to guide our feet into the way of peace. And in the Christmas narrative in Luke chapter 2, The angels come and they say, glory to God in the highest and peace be on earth to those whom He's well pleased with. And in 29, the song of Simeon, Simeon sees the Christ child in the temple and says, Lord, now you're letting your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. And if we skip ahead in Luke to chapter 19, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, part of the cries of the people says, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And this is sort of our natural setting. Our understanding is that Jesus is loving and gracious and compassionate beyond what we can even understand. So, of course, He's come to bring peace. 
So what do we do with this when Jesus Himself says, that's not what I came to bring? Peace on earth is not why I'm here, and it won't be the result of my presence. Well, there's a few things to note about this passage and some of the ones that I referenced. Notice in those passages, there is no promise for all people on earth to receive peace here. Now, you might be thinking the Christmas one with the angels, but that one still has a qualifier. It's peace to those with whom He's well pleased. And that's generally understood as those of faith. And still in this section of Scripture, Jesus is addressing His disciples specifically. He doesn't turn to the crowds until he gets to verse 54. And the crying of Hosanna to God in the highest peace in heaven for Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, notice it doesn't say peace on earth. And that was what the people were hoping from the Messiah. They were hoping that he would cast out the Romans, that he would establish an earthly kingdom of peace. But here Jesus says that is not what will happen. Instead, He says division will happen because of Him here on earth. And at first, when the shock of that statement wears off, we begin to see the truth of it, not only generally speaking or from the Scriptures, but also if we look at our own lives, our faith in Christ has not only brought peace, but it has also brought division. And the cross, the symbol of our faith, is a prime example of this strange marriage of peace and division. The cross represents the division that Christ brought by His presence and His teaching. That's why He was killed on a cross. There were many people who separated themselves from those who listened to Him and followed Him. They opposed Him, they hated Him, and they sought His death. But it also represents the peace that Christ came to bring. It is the means by which that peace was brought into this world and into those who believe in Jesus. The very same faith which Jesus tells us here on earth will bring division into our lives, is the same faith that brings the promised peace as well. So it turns out He does mean what He says here, and the fact that He does bring division is not in contradiction to the peace that He brings, but it's part of the real difficulty of following Jesus. Now, it's great in our epistle reading today, they brought up some examples in the Old Testament that really highlight the truth of this strange pairing of division and peace. Abraham believes in God, and so what does God have him do? God tests his faith by saying, sacrifice your son Isaac to me. Now, if you're familiar with the story, that's about the biggest ask that God could have made of Abraham. Abraham was desperate for an heir, and God had promised him an heir through Isaac, and so by faith he believed that God would resurrect Isaac from the dead. The division, the difficulty, but also the peace of trusting in God, knowing that if He's on your side, anything is possible. Moses, born amidst division and destruction and death on earth, born to the people of God in Egypt when all of the males were being killed by the Egyptians, division that was brought about by God blessing His people. The Egyptian Pharaoh was scared of the people of God, for they were growing too strong and too fast, for they had favor with the Lord. Division within Moses' own life, a division that drives him to despair before he comes to faith in God raised in the house of Pharaoh, but cut to the heart by the suffering of his people. And before he comes to faith, that leads him to despair, but God drives him to the wilderness 
where he considers the reproach of Christ's people better than the wealth and riches of Egypt. And as the writer of the Hebrews said, the story goes on and on and on. This is the story of God's people in the Old Testament. The very faith that brings them the peace in heaven that is promised divides them from others here on earth. A small nation of people set apart. This is what Jesus is teaching us today. After all, the story of the people of the Old Testament is your story, your people. In Christ, now that is your history, now that is your reality as well. A faith that brings peace, peace with God, no longer under the condemnation of His wrath, peace as a member of His kingdom, as a member of His family, yet division here on earth. Think of your own life. Your faith has separated you Maybe it's been separating you from family members, family members who don't share your faith or reject your faith. Even in the best of circumstances, that creates a division, and in the worst, hostility. They may believe that you're self-righteous, that you're bigoted, that you're judgmental. After all, believing in Christ, being given the gift of faith, changes you, and some people don't like that change. It can also cause division among your friendships, and many of you have probably experienced this. I had a friend who used to say, when you're with your friends, you should never talk about two subjects, religion and politics. Because inevitably, that's going to lead to conflict and the ruination of that relationship. Because faith does, in fact, cause division. At best, it's because now you have different priorities, different values, and a different direction and purpose for your life. One that they can't understand or don't share. And at worst, again, like with the family, a belief that you're judgmental, that you're evil. Well, this is the baptism that Christ spoke of in our reading today, the one that He is distressed until it is accomplished, a baptism of the fiery wrath and judgment of God. This is what St. Paul means when he says, that we are baptized into the death of Christ. He's referring to our baptism's connection to this baptism where Jesus takes the sin of the world upon Himself, suffers the baptism of the fiery wrath and judgment of God in our place, and brings us peace. This is your baptism when you went to the font or when you were brought to the font and the water touched your heads and the word, the name of God was placed upon you. You were united in Christ's death to sin on the cross. A division within yourself, actually. In baptism, what's actually going on is the old part of you, as Luther describes it, the old Adam, is being put to death. The old Adam is what Jeremiah spoke of when he said of those who have vain hopes, who follow the stubbornness of their own hearts. In baptism, you're joined to Christ's death to sin, and so that old sinful part of you is put to death, divided away. If that were all, it would be despairing, but Paul goes on and reminds us that we are also united to His resurrection. His new life is now ours as well. Division and peace in one place. Peace in heaven. You have been made right with God. 
not by any work of your own, but by the gracious love and work of Jesus. You're at peace. Your purpose and future are secure in Him, and yet you've been set apart. You've been divided from what you once knew. This death and resurrection change you. They change you from a condemned creature of this world to a living child of God, a member of God's kingdom to come. The language in the Scriptures is so strong about this. They say that you went from being dead to being alive. That's what's going on. That's why Jesus says, Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, but division. So what does this mean for each of us today? It means that you're different. You are. You've been made into a new creation. The center of your life has shifted. The orientation of your values, the understanding of the purpose of your existence has been forever changed. You have faith in God. You believe that He reigns supreme over all things. You believe that He has redeemed you through His baptism into death, a death that you have now been baptized into as well. Your different values, your decision to refuse to do certain things and to do others set you apart. You're no longer the people described in Jeremiah, straining after vain hopes, following the visions of your own mind, and listening to the stubborn voice of your own heart. You no longer follow such things. You follow Jesus, and He has given you a new heart, a heart that does not have vain hopes, but the only true hope. And it is that hope that brings you peace, peace between you and God, peace forever as His child. Jesus says some tough things, some things we'd like to explain away or we'd rather not hear. I get it, I have my list too. I've got a list of verses that certainly make my job more difficult than I'd like it to be sometimes, just as you do. He does divide in this life. He divides life from death. He divides grace from condemnation. And these divisions divide people from one another, the old and the new. But Jesus doesn't just divide. He also brings together in the peace of heaven, in His victory over sin and death. That is why it is nothing to take for granted our gathering here this morning in His name. The unity and this peace that He has come to bring is described so strongly that not, not even are you using familial language, but you are one body. You are one body in Christ Jesus. So what do we do? What do we do with a faith that divides us from the world, yet brings peace between us and God? Follow Jesus. Receive the whole counsel of His Word in faith, and do what He says. That's what's been given to us, to follow Jesus. And He leads to life, life eternal, peace with God forever. In the name of Jesus, amen.